Um, just to get started, I'm going to go ahead and put the handouts for today's workshop in the Zoom chat. So if anybody would like to go ahead and download those, and we'll also pass them around to everybody here in attendance. So, um, so yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Sorensen. I'm the GIS specialist here at the Marriott Library. Um, one of the things that I enjoy doing most is taking GIS technology to a new level. And one of those ways that we've been doing it recently is by creating 3D topographic models. So taking a data sets that contain elevation, um, different information such as that, and creating something you can actually physically print and you know, a tangible model to work with. So that is what I will be demonstrating for you today. Um, I'll also be introducing you to a new project that is currently in the development stages at the Marriott Library that allows us to project data onto these 3D models. So if you have any questions about what I'll be demonstrating today, I'll be happy to answer those for you at the end of the workshop, um, at which time I can also provide a hands-on um, demonstration with you if you'd like. All of our lab computers have all the software that I'll be covering in today's workshop. So let me go ahead and just... Um, There we go. Okay, so we're good. All right. So to start things off, I just wanted to briefly introduce you to what GIS is and why it's so important in our world today. GIS is used in many aspects of our lives, if we're really aware of it or not. And it provides a way of making many of the modern conveniences of life possible. This can range from something as simple or complex, sorry, my computer's up here. Something as complex as studying vegetation changes over time, and even something as simple as oh, you know, basis, um, uh, using our phones to navigate around town and stuff like that. Um, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, or in more recent trends is being referred to as Geospatial Information Systems. And this relates to a number of different technologies, software, processes, and methods that are used to visualize different types of data within a geospatial context. Generally, this information is presented through cartographic maps, interactive mapping platforms, or geospatial infographics. But at its core, GIS allows for the visualization, analysis, and interpretation of data in order to understand relationships, patterns, and trends in data. This is accomplished through the incorporation of multiple layers, which when brought together creates a geospatial visualization that expresses and enhances data by incorporating visual resources. Now these layers can include any of the following, imagery such as satellite or aerial photographs, elevation data sets such as contour lines or elevation models, which is what we'll be working with today, demographic data sets such as census information, transportation data sets, such as street networks or railways, address information, such as geocoded or plotted locations, physical features, including boundaries, hydrology, and survey control points, as well as research data that an individual may wish to share with their viewers. Bringing this information together provides not only an educational experience, but also a method for researchers and viewers to answer questions, find uh, relay findings and identify solutions that previously may have been unconsidered. So in today's workshop, we'll be, we'll be focusing on one particular type of GIS data utilized to create 3D topographic models. This is known as digital elevation models or DEM as you'll hear being referred to it throughout this workshop. A DEM is a data set containing elevation data representing the surface or terrain of the earth that also has the unique ability to be expressed three-dimensionally when the appropriate tools and procedures are applied. The level of detail contained in these data sets can vary depending on the resources you acquire it from. So to begin, I'd like to introduce you to a free openly available resource for acquiring high quality DEM data sets that can be used to produce a 3D model. The resource that we'll be utilizing to acquire these DEM data sets is called the National Map Viewer. It's an online resource provided by the United States Geological Survey, or USGS, that contains a wide variety of products related to the United States. 
For this workshop, we'll be focusing on a single feature found within the United States. But should you be interested in features found outside the United States, Earth Explorer, which is another online resource provided by USGS, USGS is a great resource for acquiring such data sets. When the National Map Viewer is first launched, you'll see that I am presented with an overview map of the United States, along with a selection of available data set options that are available to the left. To identify the available DEM datasets for my project, I'll begin by selecting Elevation Products 3 DEP within the selection window. I'll then narrow this down um, by selecting one third arc second DEM intervals. Now to kind of give you an idea of what that means, a one third arc second DEM roughly translates to a model that has 10 meter elevation intervals. So this is actually one of the higher quality data sets that you can find throughout the United States. Some areas have even better, but majority of the areas you'll can find 10 meter. Uh, areas outside the United States, you're looking more at one arc second, which is 30 meter intervals. So it's a little less detailed than the 10 meter, but can still produce a very nice detailed model. So I'll begin my research or my search by identifying a single location or feature on the map that I can obtain a DEM data set for. For today's workshop, I'll be creating a 3D model of Mount Rainier. So I'll begin by inputting this information into the search box, which navigates me to the location on the map. In the new pop-up window, I can select find products to display all the data sets matching my search criteria which in this case returns a single item, which is a one third arc second DEM, so a 10 meter DEM data set that represents the area around Mount Rainier. I can also select the footprint option at this point uh, to pre preview the extent of the data set, how it covers on the map, and also verify that it contains the area that I wish to include in my project. I can also use the thumbnail option to preview what this DEM will look like before I download it, um, as well as use the download option, which I'm going to do now to download and begin working with this particular data set. So I'm going to go ahead and save that to my computer. Um, one tip that I do recommend that as you begin generating these type of models is to create a new project folder for each project you're developing. Doing so really helps to avoid problems with future projects that may utilize the same data set. So once the data set has downloaded to my project folder, I'll go ahead and unzip the file and I'm ready to take the first steps towards developing my 3D model. This is an example of what the DEM data set looks like. As you can see, it's a GeoTIFF image. It contains both the image, elevation information, and location information for automatically overlaying in the correct location within a GIS mapping program. The next step in creating a 3D topographic model is to clip the original downloaded DEM into a specified area, shape, or extent. Yeah? What's the file format for downloading? Is it a big CSV file or is it something that's more specific to a DEM? Yeah, so it's a GeoTIFF image. It's going to contain like a JPEG or a TIFF in it, and then also a series of location files that are associated with that. And the GIS program knows how to read that and plot it right on the map. So, <laughs> so um, as I was mentioning, um, at this point, we can um, narrow down this DEM data set into a more specified area. This is completely optional, I will say, um, and you can proceed forward with just printing this entire data set if you want. The one issue you will run into printing something so large is the detail will be lacking because this is quite a, quite a large area we're looking at here. So I recommend viewing, you know, zooming in, cutting this, cutting this data set down into a really nice area. So like we're gonna be doing with Mount Rainier here, we're gonna get a nice model return of what the mountain and the details around it look like. So, so in this example, you'll see this is the area that I'm going to be clipping my DEM to. This is the area around Mount Rainier. Uh, you can see it's a very small portion of that downloaded data set. To perform this process, you will need access to ArcGIS software, either using ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro, which is the version that I'll be demonstrating with today. 
Um, access to both of these programs is available on Marriott Library computers, university computing labs, and also the lab computers openly available here in the 2751 suite at the Marriott Library. Um, just have to use your unit name and password to log in. Um, and that's just information on that, sorry. <laughs> so as this DEM data set contains no references to distinguish individual features from, I like to begin by selecting a base map for the project. I recommend going with either an imagery with labels or a topographic base map as they assist in identifying specific areas and features on the map. Uh, with this reference base map in place, I bring the downloaded DEM into ArcGIS Pro using the add data tool within the maps tools ribbon at the top of the screen. And I'll navigate to the file within my project folder. As you can see, once the DEM is added into ArcGIS Pro, it automatically overlays in the appropriate location on the map and also becomes a selectable layer in the table of context panel on the left side of the screen. I also have the option of zooming to the layer, should it not do so automatically, by right clicking on the layer within the table of contents and selecting the zoom to layer option. I then want to adjust the transparency of the DEM in order to see the physical features uh, and references found in my base map. I can do this by going to the appearance ribbon at the top of the screen and adjusting the transparency using the transparency slider. So I generally change this to about 30% so I can see a good transition between both layers. This is what that looks like. Um, I, from here, I can use the reference information contained in the base map to identify in, uh, the area representing Mount Rainier and go ahead and zoom in. So this is the area and then we'll zoom in just using the mouse wheel. And you can see we're right in where Mount Rainier is in that DEM. You can see the base map and reference layers poking through this as well. So I have a good reference of where I'm looking at right now. <clears throat> um, so I'm now ready to create a shape that represents the extent of Mount Rainier for my model. To do this, I'll begin by creating a feature class that will be used to create the boundary of the DEM features to be clipped. Now the boundary itself can be anything uh, as simple as a circle, which is what we'll be doing here to create the Mount Rainier model. But you can also do more complex boundaries as well, something like uh, county boundaries like Salt Lake. So we have an example of that running in the back here. Um, you know, everyone on Zoom, you'll also see what that looks like shortly as well. Um, so go ahead and do this. Um, just find my notes here. Um, I'll begin by going to the catalog panel on the right side of the screen and navigating to my project folder where I'll right click on the associated geodatabase folder and select a new and feature class. So using the feature class tool, I'll input information to create a polygon representing the boundary shape. And since I'm only creating a single feature, I'm only gonna be adding a very small amount of attribute data to this data set. Uh, selecting okay, I can then click and drag this boundary layer into my map folder and I'm ready to create the actual shape that's gonna be used to clip the boundary. To do that, I'll go ahead and highlight the clip boundary layer that I just created within the table of contents. And within the edit ribbon at the top of the screen, I'll create, select create features. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of how that's done. Sorry, I'm just get, catching up here. <laughs> Um, I can go ahead and left click on the center of the Mount Rainier model that I'm interested in doing. So right in the center of the screen, I'll select the circle option. And then I can click and drag the extent of how big and how far I want my model to go. You can kind of see the animation here. I'll just let it run one more time. And that shape's gonna represent the clip that we use for our model. <clears throat> so now that we have that boundary in place, I'm going to clip the DEM to export only those features from the DEM that are found um, on the DEM layer within that circle. So to do this, I can go ahead and go to the analysis ribbon at the top of the screen and select tools. And I'll do a search to find the clip raster tool and select it 
to go through the available options. Within this new processing window, I input the DEM layer as the layer file to be clipped, the feature layer class as the boundary to put the features within. Um, I'll name the new DEM file and select both extent boxes, then choose run. From here, this is the result that we get. Um, you'll see that it's a new version of the DEM clipped to just the social area that we've selected in that previous uh, step. Um, this is actually the data set that we'll be using from this point forward to create our 3D model. So with this step done, I can go ahead and close ArcGIS Pro and move forward to the next step. And that step is involves converting the clip DEM data set into an actual 3D model or an STL file that will be used to generate that final model. To do this, you will need access to QGIS. This is a free and openly available software program available for download from the QGIS website. Uh, it's also available on the lab computers here in 2751. Um, unlike ArcGIS Pro, QGIS does have one particular tool that we need for generating 3D models, and this is called DEM 3D printing. So I'll begin by opening QGIS, navigating to the new clip DEM data set, and adding it to my QGIS project. In the raster menu at the top of the screen, I'll select DEM to 3D and choose 3D printing. Uh, in the new processing tool window, I'll input size and layer information that will be used to generate the 3D model. Now for this model, I'll be applying the following information that are based on specifications for one of the Marriott Library's TAS-6 printers. Um, for the extent, I'm gonna go ahead and choose to print the full extent, which means that I wanna, I wanna include the entire area within that red dash box surrounding it, so my entire model. For print spacing or how thick I want each layer to be, I want these to be on the thinner side, so I'm going to go with a 0.2 millimeter. I sometimes even refer, reduce this further to a 0.1 or 0.15 millimeter as well. For dimensions, I want my model to be the maximum size of the print bed. So for the TAS 6 printers, this is about 11 inches or 279.6 millimeters. We also have other printers here at the Merritt Library that can do much larger. Um, the Gigabot printers in particular can print up to a maximum of 24 inches or 609.6 millimeters. For exaggeration, I do want to emphasize the peaks on my model. So I increase these to anywhere from 1.2 to 1.5. I have found that if you do anything more than that, they tend to distort the features and just don't look like what you're finding in the real world. <laughs> and then finally for height, I input the lowest point indicated in the provided elevation data located to the right. From here, I select export to SDL, making sure to maintain the default file name for the export. The reason I do this is to avoid a common error in the export process that tends to make the process fail, um, but you can rename the file, the model file after it's all completed being exported at the end. Now, depending on the file size, the size of your model output, and the processing power of your computer, this process may take some time to complete. But once it does, you'll end up with a new model that looks something like this. Um, this is just running that mix, uh, model that was exported using a 3D preview program. Um, this one is called Print 3D. It's on the Windows machines. I think all the downloads have those available. And it gives me a chance just to make sure everything in my model looks Good. So I can see that all the features look really nice. I've got a nice detailed model going here and I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is printing. So yeah, we're on the, to the home stretch now. Um, I'm gonna use another program. I'm introducing you guys to a lot of programs today. Um, this program is actually gonna be used to convert the STL file into a code that a 3D printer can understand. Um, the program that I'm going to be demonstrating for you is called Prusa Slicer. There are other ones out there. I have found this one to be the most user-friendly, um, especially if you're new to 3D printing and models, getting working with them. Um, it's a very easy program to start working with. It's also a free, uh, openly available program for download from the Slicer website. Um, it's also available on uh, dedicated slicing computers here at the Merritt Library. There are some out here 
in the proto space area that have that available to them or by the 3D printers. We also have them on the lab computers as well. So everything you need is right here. <clears throat> so to demonstrate this in Slicer, I begin by adding the exported 3D model that was created in the previous step. And utilizing the available tools within Slicer, I can apply changes to the final model, which include adjustments to the overall scale and removal of additional material generated during the export process. So in this example, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that square boundary at the bottom that was resulted during the export process so that I just have a circular model representing Mount Rainier. Once I'm satisfied with the final appearance, um, I go ahead and select the Slice Now tool to begin generating the layers of the model to be printed. Now, this process is really interesting because it gives you really an overview of what this printing process is going to be like. So you can see each layer of the model being printed. So you'll know what your model is going to look like throughout the process. And it also gives you information later on about print times, uh, weights and stuff of the print. So you can kind of know what this model would cost you to print. Um, once this splicing process has completed, I go ahead and select the export G code option and save the file to my project folder. It's this G code that will be exported that was used to create the final printed model. So um, at this point, I can see everything looks good. I go ahead and close Slicer, and we have one more step in the process. And that is printing your 3D model. So with that G code for the final model ready to go, I can now begin the 3D print. The printing process can be as simple as finding a 3D printer, such as those located at the Marriott Library, loading some printing filament into the printer, loading that exported G code, and selecting print or even by uploading the G-code online and having it printed by a member of the 3D printing services team. What you'll end up with is something like this, and I'm happy to send this around. This is the same model that uh, everybody is seeing on Zoom right now. Um, <clears throat> so it's what you're seeing is a detailed model of Mount Rainier that was created using all the processes covered in the workshop today and printed on a machine here at the Marriott Library. The Marriott Library has a number of 3D printers available for use by students, staff, and faculty at the University of Utah, as well as expert staff on hand to assist in answering any questions. Um, for those of you watching over Zoom, uh, pictures really don't do the model justice unless you see it in person. Um, there's a lot of detail that goes into these and Honestly, the camera doesn't do a very good job picking up because you don't really know the size and everything you're seeing. Um, but it does a really good job of accurately depicting these features that are found in the real world. <clears throat> now, as you begin developing your own 3D topographic models, it's important to know that experts at the Marriott Library are available to support the development of your project and assist with, and assist with any questions you have along the way. Uh, should you require any assistance generating a topographic model, I'm happy to provide that um, through one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, helping you understand these processes and working through them together. Um, people are able to get a hold of me, schedule an appointment through the GIS Services website. Uh, additionally, our expert staff in 3D printing services are also available to assist with the model slicing, and any issues with the 3D printing process and information about the available printers and detailed information on that can be found on their website. So as you've seen today, DEM data sets are extremely useful for creating 3D topographic models of features found around the world. But the process of simply printing and examining these models is just the beginning. I'd now like to introduce you to another project in development here at the Marriott Library. Um, the idea for it started very simple. How do we combine the power of GIS technology with 3D printing? The important role that GIS plays has the ability to be taken to another level, projecting various geospatial data sets directly onto a 3D printed model. Stage one of our projection concept began in 2018. We began with very simplified 3D topographic prints 
these were strictly for test purposes. And we knew that based on the quality output that we were seeing that we would definitely need higher quality data for the project to progress further. In these images, you can see that the results of those initial tests, prints, and efforts to project GIS data from Google Maps onto the models was successful in using a handheld, I'm sorry, using a handheld portable projector. Um, while very simplistic in its approach, the results did prove that the possibility for projecting data onto these models was there and that the project had great potential if taken to the next level. That next level was stage two. Um, this projection concept began in 2019. Um, the process for acquiring, exporting, and converting DEM data sets into customized 3D models was refined with larger, highly detailed models being created, uh, such as in this example, um, where you'll see a large scale wall mounted model of Salt Lake County printed at almost two feet wide with silver filament. And the um, model that you're seeing on Zoom is the same one that we have on display here in Protospace today. So um, everyone in attendance, you're welcome to check this out after the workshop, uh, get a close-up close view of what we're trying to accomplish here with this project. <clears throat> so the stage two projection concept utilizes a mobile projection unit with various static images of data that are continuously projected on loop using a mini Raspberry Pi computer. Here is just an example of how this uh, projection works on um, the different slideshows in action. You'll see various data sets being projected, including satellite. Here is uh, municipal and transportation data. Uh, this is the original 10 meter elevation data, looking at the different highs and lows of the county. Uh, incorporating some hydrology layers into that, uh, doing some more analysis with some crime analysis data, which is really interesting. And then I guess you can see the original model again. <clears throat> so the results of this project, um, or at least this stage of it, showed that um, this was a very viable method for bringing new life into this data and then also utilizing 3D models at the same time. So we began moving forward with the next step, but unfortunately COVID hit, <laughs> put a halt on this project completely. Um, however, with our new physical area up in protospace uh, and more services being brought back online, we do see new life being brought back into this project. For that next stage in this concept, um, a further developed fine-tuned model is in development. Um, currently, I've scaled models of all 29 Utah counties and submitted them to our expert 3D printing services team for the large-scale printing. When complete, a large topographic model of Utah with individually interconnected county tiles will be on display within the Merritt Library. Um, I'm anticipating this is gonna be anywhere between five feet wide to four feet high. So um, most likely we'll have a 4K projector that will be installed either on a stand, projected at a wall, assuming we can find the large depth area, most likely sitting on a table with a projector shooting down from the ceiling. Um, it'll also be able to work with individuals GIS data as well. So people will be able to bring in their own data as well plug it into a tablet or computer system and interact with their data that they're creating. So again, this is currently in development. It's unknown exactly when it will be deployed, but I do encourage you to stay tuned through the library's social media channels, blog posts, and the GIS services website as more information becomes available. Um, I would like to conclude this workshop just by thanking all of you for taking time to join us today for your interest in learning more about our 3D topographic modeling and printing efforts at the Marriott Library. I hope it's provided you with some helpful information about developing your own 3D models and protect some, you know, possibly some ideas for utilizing this information in your own projects and research. Again, should you need any assistance, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help with that. And also the 3D printing services team can help you with the final model creation. Um, also know that you, um, everyone is welcome to use the GIS or the lab computers here in 2751. All that software again that we've covered today is available on these machines. Um, and the area is open for use Monday through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, um, 
with that, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or. <laughs> yeah. That was very cool, thanks. Um, I don't know if you saw the head of photography at the art school had an exhibition at the museum recently and he used um, 3D scanning of the Grand Canyon somewhere and then he digitally added light sources and some haze and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, questions about data sets. Are there data sets available for man-made objects as well? Uh, for example, fly over over downtown Salt Lake or Manhattan. Um, can they can they be uh, obtained? They can. I think you're thinking of things like um, like some drone footage, possibly even lidar information. Yeah, all those are downloaded or available for download. Um, like I said, I'd be happy to even help you look into that if you're interested. We could find out what kind of data is available. So, cool. in addition, are there data sets available for like ocean terrain as well? I assume there is. Yeah. So that particular, you'd be looking more with the DEMs. They stop at sea level. What you'd be doing is looking into something more like uh, bathmetric data. So we've actually had um, one professor come in who was interested in incorporating ocean layers as well, something below sea level and combining with the bulk, and we found a way to merge the two together. It does take a little bit of extra to combine them, um, kind of have to use another program called Blender, okay. just to kind of get the two models to come together. But I have some friends who are fishermen in Boston, like to make them a 3D model in Cape Cod and, and uh, the Outer Bank and such. Last question, are there um, data sets available for the other planets? Is, is there a moon database? You know, I don't believe there is elevation data for that right now. I could look into that for you. But um, yeah, as far as I know right now, the only stuff right we can find is for Earth at the moment. <laughs> so. That's enough to work with. Just to follow up on that, where is the man made data? Like what, what side or what portion? Oh, gosh, there are so many different websites for the different types of man made data and stuff like that. Um, I usually just start with a Google search, narrow down from there if it's something the government might have available. USGS might usually have it. Um, a lot of these things are through the National Map Bureau. They have different data sets available there. Is there a specific type that has historical data, like uh, let's say it was like a few years ago? Um, in terms of like projected data or like the data we worked with today? Yeah, I guess it wouldn't be 50 years because the technology wasn't there, but like <laughs> 10 years ago, is there, is there a I think different studies and stuff do. One, when I was initially starting to learn 3D modeling and printing and stuff like this, one of the first models I worked with was Mount St. Helens. I wanted to see the difference between how it was pre-1980 and then after the eruption. And I was actually able to find somebody who did some research and found the original model. We were able to reconstruct that data so we can see how much of the whole mountainside blew apart during that eruption. So the data is out there. It's just a matter of finding it. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when you're dealing with terrain or topography that has some water and some bare land, mm -hmm. um, how is there a way to specify whether you want to print the water or to print what's below the water? Like if it were the Great Salt Lake, for example. It's a good question. I, I want to say with the DEMs, though, because we did look into the Salt Lake, or Great Salt Lake area. It all seems very flat there. I'm not sure how much elevation changed. Maybe it wasn't enough in the model to show. Um, I guess I noticed what made me think of it was on the Rainier, it mm -hmm. looked like you could see a glacier. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure if there's a way to take that glacier out or mm -hmm. is that right? I, I think you could manipulate the data. So if you if you knew the result you wanted to do, you would just go into the ArcGIS software to begin do all of your analysis work before you ever export and stuff like that. Um, I think it'd be easy to, you know, identify it with a projection. Like you could show that data very easily on the model, but just taking it out of the model itself might be a little more tricky. Um, but yeah, it, I, I'd say anything's possible though. <laughs> so. yeah, I guess uh, one more question. If, sure. if I were to make something like this to use as a mold, mm -hmm. to cast something in, what would you suggest to seal up some of the some of the spots where it's not so tight? Like there's a couple of like holes where you can see light through it. Yeah, this particular model, it could have used a few more um, top layers on it. That's why you can see a few gaps on it. Um, it also didn't have a solid bottom on the bottom. We just were testing. So it's, this is just infill that you're seeing and 
everybody on the Zoom can probably see that there as well. Um, that would be a question I would bring up with 3D printing about that, just to see what they suggest. But yeah, that is one thing with this layer, this particular model. I do wish I put a couple more layers, top layers on it, just to make it a more fleshed out, presentable look. So. Yeah, <laughs> You will see here working with a mountain or like an area around here with a lot of dramatic rise and falls that works. But what if you're like, I uh, want to print out the Midwest, so it's flat, right? Mm -hmm. How would you specify the more details or what, what would you concentrate on to kind of delineate the different characteristics of, let's say, Illinois or Kansas or something like that? Do you focus on rivers as sort of a, of a landmark? Um, I think it's really in just what kind of model you want to do. I don't, you know, for me particularly, you know, I wanted to see the mountains. I wanted to see the details. So I kind of emphasize those aspects of it. But I could see those when I was exporting a model of what features I want to focus on in particular. So looking at something more flat, I would probably want to play around with like exaggeration levels. With the DEMs, it's only focusing on the elevation data itself. So if there were some higher hills or something there, maybe I want to exaggerate it just a little more to give a little more emphasis in that area. So. Um, regarding your future plans to uh, build out some more detailed uh, production, mm -hmm. um, are there plans to make it interactive? Uh, let's say you were able to create have a CPU with uh, projecting, like could mm -hmm. users, instead of like cycling through uh, these different displays, could users mm -hmm. specify what they're interested in seeing? Or yeah, um, my thoughts are to right now to incorporate ArcGIS online with it. And that has a lot of like interactive options. So you can create a bunch of different layers. Uh, users can come in, turn them off and on, work with them, do different kinds of mashups and stuff with it. I also want to give them ability to bring in their own data as well. So bringing in on a flash drive, I'm not sure what that's going to look like just yet, but if they're working on something, of, you know, say something related to their research and they just want to see how that data overlays on that. Yeah. So I want them to have that ability. So that's definitely something under consideration at this time. Yeah, I was also thinking of like something uh, as banal as weather patterns, mm -hmm. <laughs> seeing what the weather's going to look like. Oh, yeah. Uh, or, in real time or even like absolutely yeah because they do have the live data running through the um, arcgis online you can bring a layer in that brings live data like that so i can see in that type of situation it'd be really interesting to have like all the mountain ranges and stuff and see this storm front coming in what's it going to do to impact is it going to go around is it going to impact it some way <laughs> so yeah it'd be really cool to incorporate live data as well Traffic data would also be really interesting too, seeing what's happening throughout the state at one time. <laughs> yeah, like overlaying traffic and air pollution with the same on the same map. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did we have any questions on that? Uh, no, Tony just said that we should uh, print this at some point, which is Castleton Tower. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So Tony's one of my colleagues I work with. He's really interested in Castleton Tower. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Um, I know he wanted to take like a drone and fly it around there and get like a really cool model of it. So, but yeah, Tony, that'd be really cool to print that out. <laughs> well, if there's no other questions, um, like I said, thank you so much for your time and consideration of this project. And if you'd like, you're welcome to stick around and try out the models and software here and anybody online please reach out if you have any questions so this is a quick question Justin. Sure. do you have sample data for playlist anywhere no just following the um, steps through that in the handouts um, you can really choose any location you want with it so i, I leave it to you whatever features in the world are most interesting to you start there <laughs> that's what i say when you're done with it because i'm trying to find stuff and i'm like can't make it through like, finding the data. Oh, so if you have a second, yeah, you bet. Absolutely. This to just like help you make it easier. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can say thank you to Justin and then we'll uh, fill in from there. Great. All right. Thank you. <laughs>